Recording is in progress. And Suba, it's all yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Trudy, for welcoming everybody. And uh, let me add in my welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to everybody that has joined us today for Tuesday Explorers, a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by AARP Virginia. Truly, thank you for joining us today. I'm Suba Sadi, an AARP Volunteer Community Ambassador with AARP Virginia. AARP is here to make your voice heard and provide information and resources on the issues that matter and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational, and fun resources, things like webinars, teletown halls, discounts, and more. I'd like to thank my co-host and fellow volunteer today, Trudy Murata. She will facilitate the Q&A portion of our program. We will have time for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. So please submit your questions in the Q&A box. It could be a part of a comment as well. We expect the program to last for about one hour. When our guest speaker is talking, you can still put in your questions if you think about anything and Trudy will capture them at the end. I am excited about our program today. Though many focus on the battles fought in the North, it was the battles in South that ended the war. While the focus of the American Revolutionary War is often on the New England and Mid-Atlantic colonies, did you know that more battles took place in the South than in any other region? England's Southern campaign sought to end the stalemate in the North, but led to the surrender of British General Cornwallis's army at Yorktown effectively ending the war. Today's guest speaker, Blaine Amthor, will share the intriguing personalities, unusual tactics, and fighting among Americans that could be considered our country's first civil war. Blaine is a federal employee with more than 35 years of public service. He is retiring the end of this month, so our congratulations to him. A Philadelphia native, he has had a long, lifelong history and lifelong interest in history, particularly World War II, ocean liners, and the American Revolution. He enjoys visiting sites related to these subjects to learn about them in greater detail, and he will soon be retiring, as I said. So I imagine he'll have a lot more time for these pursuits. It is my pleasure to turn over the program to Blaine. Blaine, the screen is yours. Hey, thank you, Suba, and thank you, everybody at AARP. I'm excited to present this topic. And um, <clears throat> so as I go along, I have a laser pointer here that I will be using, but I'll be pointing out the various uh, pictures and paintings on the slides that I'll be using. So to begin, for the first five years of the Revolutionary War, the British focus was in the North and Mid-Atlantic regions, since that is where the revolution began, where the capital Philadelphia was located, where the harbor and major economic center of New York was, and where the bulk of the Cont Continental Army resided. Most battles occurred in this region at places which we know, such as Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. And you see a painting there on the top left of Concord and on the right of Bunker Hill. This period also includes the American retreat from New York, the chase of the Continental Army by the British across New Jersey into Pennsylvania, Washington's crossing of the Delaware, the battles of Trenton and Princeton, the occupation of Philadelphia, and the winters at Valley Forge and Morristown, New Jersey. And on the lower left there, you see the, the annual reenactment of Washington's crossing of the Delaware, and on the right, a reenactment of Valley Forge. In 1778, the tide of the war turned with the American victory at Saratoga, New York. This victory had the huge effect of France recognizing America as an independent nation, declaring war on England and providing supplies and troops to the Americans in greater amounts than before. Britain now had a major adversary in addition to the colonial rebellion to deal with. 
The victory at Saratoga also ended the British effort to try to divide the New England colonies along the Hudson River. Now, from the beginning of the Revolutionary War, the British focus in the South was an effort to take advantage of loyalists who Britain believed would provide a large amount of support. Most American forces in the South at this time were militia, not regular army troops. In an effort to be active in the region and gain loyalist support, the British needed a major seaport to support their operations. In February, 1776, the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge in North Carolina was part of the first British effort to open a Southern theater by capturing the port of Charleston, South Carolina. And on this left photo here, you see Moores Creek Bridge. The first battle of the revolution to occur in North Carolina, it pitted loyalist and patriot militias against each other. The American victory ended fighting by loyalist units for two years and hurt Britain's effort to open a Southern port. Now, despite this defeat, in June 1776, the British attacked Charleston, South Carolina, but failed to capture it. Consequently, two years later in 1778, the British capture Savannah, Georgia, the port they needed, and hold it until the end of the war despite an American French effort to recapture it. During the first five years of the war, several other battles also take place in the South, such as the Battles of the Snow Campaign in Northwestern South Carolina. Six, um, where the British sought to take advantage of a division between loyalists and patriots. Fighting ended in a two foot snowstorm, which gave the battles their name. While these battles had little strategic value, they forged the beginning of a lasting and proud patriot militia in the Carolinas, a factor that would come into play later. In 1780, the British again focus on the South in an effort to recruit and expand Loyalist support. The British believed incorrectly that the level of Loyalist support was large and just waiting to be tapped. This was due to Loyalist exiles in London petitioning for British involvement in the South to recover their land and businesses. In addition, the British sought to end the stalemate of the war in the North by gaining control of Georgia and the Carolinas, moving into Virginia and forcing an American surrender. In April, May, 1780, the British under Gen Lieutenant Generals Henry Clinton, who you see on the top middle here, and Charles Cornwallis, who you see on the top right, lay siege to Charleston South Carolina, which you see here on the, the map on the left. This began the major Southern campaign. Now the British troops outnumbered the colonists by two to one. By controlling the harbor and using army units to cut off land-based communications and supplies, the Americans who were in Charleston under General Benjamin Lincoln were forced to surrender on May 12th and you see a portrait of Lincoln on the lower right. This was one of the worst American defeats of the, of the revolution. The Americans lost a large fighting force, about 5,000 soldiers, many senior officers, tons of supplies and weapons, and the South's largest city and port. The captured American soldiers and sailors were imprisoned. The British imposed unconditional surrender on the Americans, a huge humiliation. American military activity in the South nearly collapsed. After the loss of Charleston, the fighting was carried on by partisans such as Francis Marion, Thomas Sumter, William R. Davy, Andrew Pickens, and Elijah Clark. Serving as a carrier under William R. Davy was a 13-year-old boy, Andrew Jackson, future president of the US. 
A little known aspect of the Revolutionary War is the topic of prisoners. Prisoners presented the British with a challenge since treating them as prisoners of war would be to acknowledge the independence of the colonies. Consequently, the British did not abide by existing guidelines that dealt with prisoners. Prisoners on both sides were subject to the corrupt practices of their captors. Both sides had difficulty housing prisoners and made do with makeshift facilities such as barns, warehouses, homes, and colleges. An example of one of those you can see on the top left. Typical of that era, officers were treated differently from sailors and soldiers, often being paroled. The British used old merchant ships as prisons for sailors. Cramming the sailors below decks, some were so crowded that the men could not lie down. Brutality and neglect was common. The air sometimes was so foul that often a lamp could not be kept lit. More prisoners died than men in combat during the entire war. And you can see an example of one of those prison ships here in the top middle. Prison ships were in many locations, such as Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. New York was the most notorious location where 11,500 prisoners died, and that represented 75% of the prisoners. So three out of four prisoners died. These ships in New York were located in the East River in Wallabout Bay, currently the location of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. While there were many ships, the most infamous one was the Jersey, which had the nickname of Hell. And you can see a sketch of the Jersey there on the lower middle and the inside on the lower left. On Jersey, five to 10 prisoners a day died from starvation, disease, and flogging, the bodies being thrown overboard the next morning or only when convenient. Bodies that washed up on shore were often buried by locals. The operation of the ships in New York fell under the British Provost Marshal Captain William Cunningham, who was the same man who handled the execution of Nathan Hale. Fort Greene Park Martyrs Monument, which you see on the right, dedicated in 1908, contains the remains of prisoners discovered during construction of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Restored several times, it is under consideration to be part of the National Park Service. Following the American defeat at Charleston in May 1780, the British move out seeking to establish a series of outposts supporting their effort to control the Carolinas. General Cornwallis takes over command from General Clinton, who moves to New York. As the British began moving out from Charleston, it was learned that South Carolina Governor John Rutledge was escaping to North Carolina to establish the government in exile there. A British Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton was dispatched to overtake him and his escorting troops. And you see a portrait of Tarleton on the lower left. And you'll hear a lot about him today. So Tarleton was a well-known and capable cavalry officer who ha had already had success at places such as at the Siege of Charleston. Though the Americans had a big head start, Tarleton's force riding day and night in high heat covered 100 miles in just 54 hours, catching the Americans at Waxhaws, South Carolina. And you can see a picture of the Waxhaws battlefield here at the top. After the Americans refused Tarleton's demand for surrender, both sides prepared for battle. The British cavalry charged and quickly overran the American forces under Colonel Abraham Buford, who you see on the lower right. The reason what happened next is still in dispute, but the British gave no quarter to the Americans, many of whom tried to surrender, instead cutting them down with sabers and bayonets, resulting in the loss of most of the American force and the dead being buried in a mass grave. And you can see in the lower middle here, painting of the 
um, charge of the British cavalry. And on the top right is that mass grave. The belief that Tarleton and his troops had intentionally massacred the Patriots had a huge psychological motivating effect on the Americans. For the rest of the war, the Patriots used this event as a rallying point to show no mercy on the British, calling this notion Tarleton's Quarter, meaning take no prisoners. So remember that term, Tarl Tarleton's Quarter, because that will come up again. Tarleton earned several nicknames, such as Bloody Ban, Ban the Barbarian, and Ban the Bloody Scout. Now Camden, which is northwest of Charleston, was a small but important logistical and supply base for Cornwallis's effort to win control of South Carolina and recruit loyalists. General Washington, alarmed at the situation in South Carolina, sent General Horatio Gates and a force to the area to join Brigadier General Johann Baron de Kalb's units from Maryland and Delaware that were already in the area. And you see General Horatio Gates on the top left and de Kalb there in the middle. Now de Kalb was one of the finest American commanders of the war. In August 1780, against the advice of his officers, Gates marched his troops on a direct route to Camden, a route with difficult terrain and an unfriendly territory which provided no supplies along the way. Due to bad food and rations of molasses instead of the usual rum, dysentery broke out in the American troops before the battle, so they were already in bad shape before the fighting began. Cornwallis, aware of the American movements, sent reinforcements to Camden from Charleston. Both forces ran into each other at night, fought briefly, disengaged, but reformed for battle the next day. With the Americans' weakest troops, inexperienced militia from North Carolina and Virginia, facing the best British units, within minutes, the American left side collapsed and fled firing hardly any shots. The right side under DeKalb fought well and pushed the British back until Cornwallis rallied them. And you can see a painting of DeKalb's units there engaging the British. Tarleton's cavalry and British infantry encircled DeKalb's troops, capturing, wounding, or killing most of them, including DeKalb, who was wounded 11 times and died three days later. And you can see a painting there of that taking place on the lower right. The Kalb is down on the ground here being bayoneted. General Gates fled the field when the left side collapsed and was 60 miles away in Charleston, North Carolina by that evening. Camden was the worst loss suffered by an American army during the entire Revolutionary War. Morale dropped and the Southern army consisted of just a few hundred men. South Carolina and Georgia were now under British control. However, this humiliating defeat opened the door for a new way of fighting. Following the disastrous defeat at Camden and due to the lack of a regular army, the Patriot forces in South Carolina organized into small mobile partisan groups of fighters consisting mostly of state militia. They operated out of numerous camps located in the back country and swamps of the Eastern part of South Carolina, seeking to quickly strike British and Tory patrols and then rapidly move on to another location. And on the lower right here, you can see a painting of one of the creative ways they used to get around that swampy area. Using unconventional tactics, these groups sought to harass the British, draw them away from their supply bases and wear them down. There were numerous leaders, but two of the best known were Francis Swamp Fox Marion, who you see in the top two uh, paintings here on the left, and um, Thomas Sumter, the Carolina Gamecock, and you see him on the top right. 
Tarleton, learning of Marion's whereabouts on one occasion, chased him for seven hours and 26 miles. After Marion disappeared into a swamp, Tarleton gave up, stating, as for this damned old fox, the devil himself could not catch him. There is no evidence that the nickname of Swamp Fox was used for Marion during the war, but it may have originated in a book written later about him. But the name has remained as a national forest, which you see on the lower left there. And even a former Philadelphia Eagles head coach, Marion Campbell, was given the nickname Swamp Fox for his defensive craftiness when he played football at University of Georgia and was a defensive coordinator in the NFL. Now, after Sumter defeated the British at the Battle of Blackstock's Farm, Tarleton complained that Sumter fought like a Gamecock inspiring his nickname, the Carolina Gamecock. Cornwallis considered Sumter such an annoyance that in later years, he called him one of his great plagues. During the war, there were three groups of people, Whigs, who were the Patriots, Tories, who were the Loyalists, and Neutrals. A victory by one of the groups would increase recruitments and morale for the winning side, and sometimes influence the neutrals to lean to one side. During July 1780, more than a dozen engagements were fought between loyalists and patriots in South Carolina alone. These battles and the overall political situation often pitted neighbors against neighbors, brothers against brothers, and were not limited to the South, but occurred throughout the colonies. So this was America's first civil war. There were several influential battles, such as Kettle Creek and Williamson's Plantation, which were American victories, but involved trials and hangings, as well as executions of British prisoners. And an activity of retribution by both sides that would continue to the war's end. This type of activity demonstrated the ruthlessness of the fighting and the intensity of the overall situation that is frequently not part of the story that is told of the Revolutionary War. A major player on the Loyalist side was British Major Patrick Ferguson, an experienced soldier who had invented a breech-loading rifle, a game-changing weapon the British Army finally adopted 100 years later. He successfully recruited loyalists who fought well under him. And you see a portrait of Ferguson there in the top middle. Following the British victory at Camden and success in recruiting in North Carolina, Ferguson threatened to destroy the homes of and hang everyone west of the Blue Ridge Mountains if they did not pledge allegiance to the crown. In October 1780, patriots in that region, known as the Overmountain Men, taking offense to this, gathered and marched about 330 miles, following Ferguson to Kings Mountain. And you see the reenactors of the Overmountain Men here on the lower left, and a picture of Kings Mountain on the top left. Ferguson had taken position on top of Kings Mountain, expecting reinforcements that did not arrive. And you can see on this right photo here, that ridge along the top of the mountain between those two white monuments is where Ferguson's troops were located. The Patriots surrounded the mountain, cut off the only escape route and slowly closed in. And you see that portrayed in this picture on the lower right. As some loyalists tried to surrender, the Patriots refused their surrender, shouting Tarleton's quarter. Remember that from before. Except for Ferguson, who was killed at the battle and is buried there, every man who fought at Kings Mountain was native to America. And you see a monument to Ferguson there, which is at Kings Mountain. Kings Mountain, a resounding American victory, was the largest engagement of Patriot and Loyalist forces during the entire war and a much needed morale boost after several defeats. The battle severely limited the Loyalist movement 
and caused a pause in the British military efforts in North Carolina, allowing the Americans time to reorganize its Southern forces. Now, recognizing the necessity of not losing the South, General Washington ordered General Nathaniel Green, who you see on the left, to take over and lead the Southern Department of American Forces and promoted Daniel Morgan, who you see on the right, to Brigadier General to join Green. Now, these were two very interesting characters. Nathaniel Green was a Rhode Island Quaker from a pacifist family. Always interested in the military, he finally renounced his pacifism to fight for the Patriots. At 34, he was the youngest brigadier general in the American army. He led a column of troops at the battles of Trenton, Princeton, Brandywine, and Monmouth. He was a brilliant quartermaster general, keeping the army fed at Valley Forge. One of Washington's most trusted subordinates Washington had said that if anything happened to him, he hoped Green would be named to, to succeed him. Daniel Morgan was from New Jersey, but settled near Winchester, Virginia. He worked as a teamster, earning the nickname the Old Wagoner. During the French and Indian War, he annoyed a superior officer, receiving 500 lashes. He boasted that the British had miscounted and that they still owed him one lash. He possessed an outstanding ability to implement tactics outside traditional doctrine as demonstrated at the Battle of Calpens. These men complemented each other through Green's strong sense of strategy and Morgan's excellent tactical ability. In January, 1781, Although Green's forces were outnumbered three to one, he implemented an unorthodox strategy of splitting his small force with Cornwallis's force between them. Cornwallis would be forced to choose one group to pursue or to split his force to go after both of them. So if Cornwallis chose one group to pursue, he left himself vulnerable to the other group. Cornwallis dispatched Tarleton's force to pursue Morgan while Cornwallis pursued Green. Morgan, aware that Tarleton was chasing him, stayed on the move, avoiding battle, maneuvering toward the Broad River near the North and South Carolina border. Morgan chose as the place for battle, a grazing area known as Hannah's Cowpens, though it seemed to be a poor location to take on a cavalry force. It offered protection on both sides due to forest and swamp and forced the British to come at him head on. And you can see here on the top left, <clears throat> this is actually at the Calpins battlefield. And this is the road the British marched up to engage the Americans. And on the lower left is the battlefield itself. Morgan positioned his troops in three lines of increasing experience and ability, which would fire a few rounds, retreat, and draw in the British, taking advantage of Tarleton's aggressiveness. Now, Tarleton's troops went on the attack directly from a long forced march with just four hours of sleep and 48 hours and not having eaten in about a day. Morgan's plan worked perfectly, and in less than an hour, he smashed the elite British force. And you can see here on the top right, the American cavalry attacking the British troops and the two lines of infantry here on the bottom with Morgan in the white uniform on the horse. Now, Calpens is the second most decisive defeat of the British during the entire war, following only Trenton and proved to be the turning point of the war in the South. The British losses at this battle were devastating, with about 90% of their force killed, wounded, or captured. Morgan wrote to Green after the battle, I was desirous to have a stroke at Tarleton. My wishes are gratified, and I have given him a devil of a whipping. This resounding victory raised American morale everywhere, but it also raised British and Loyalist ire. 
A furious Cornwallis began to pursue Morgan's and Green's forces, seeking to destroy them and free the British prisoners. The day after the battle at Calpens, Morgan had his force on the march to the north, knowing Cornwallis would be chasing him. He joined with Green's force and headed for the Dan River, where they would cross into Virginia to get additional troops and supplies, knowing they would have to face Cornwallis in battle at some time. So if you look at the map here on the left, you can see Calpens highlighted in the yellow and the dotted blue line is Morgan's force. He begins heading north and a solid blue line here is uh, Green's force and they join. And the red line is the uh, forces of Cornwallis who is pursuing them. And their goal was to get up here to the Dan River. So in an effort to be able to move more quickly, Cornwallis burned most of his army's wagons and supplies. Soldiers carried only what they needed. One of Cornwallis's officers, Charles O'Hara wrote, it was resolved to follow Green's army to the end of the world. And I want you to remember Charles O'Hara because he'll appear a little bit later on. Green, upon learning of Cornwallis's pursuit, startled his staff by saying, then he is ours. So they must have been confused because Cornwallis is mad, he's chasing the army, and Green tells them we have him just where we want him. The American force managed to stay a day or sometimes just hours ahead of the British army. Now remember it was January, so it's winter time. Both armies traveled on roads that were muddy by day and frozen at night due to a constant cold rain. The rain swelled rivers and fords making the many crossings during the pursuit precarious. There were several skirmishes along the way as Cornwallis sought a major battle, but Morgan and Green avoided it and continued moving their forces north. In one stretch heading for Guilford Courthouse, Morgan's troops covered 47 miles in 48 hours. So you have to remember that that's all on foot. Green detached a small group under Colonel Otho Williams to scout for Cornwallis, draw him away from the main force and delay him at all costs. Cornwallis took this bait and followed Williams, costing valuable time. Colonel Thaddeus Kosciusko was sent ahead by Green to build defenses and Lieutenant Colonel Edward Carrington was dispatched to identify crossings and gather boats to cross the Dan River. Now reaching the Dan River, the Patriots began crossing on February 13th with the troops and boats and the horses swimming across. Williams troops having completed their diversion crossed during the night of February 14th. The British arrived early on the morning of the 15th to find the Americans across the river and all the boats on the other side. On the last leg of this pursuit, Cornwallis had marched his army 40 miles in 31 hours, but the Americans had done it in 20. The Americans had won the 200 mile, four week race to the Dan. This race was one of the most important events of the Revolutionary War, since it allowed the Patriot Army in the South to survive, fight later battles, and put Cornwallis in a precarious state that would eventually lead him to Yorktown. After crossing the Dan River, Green had drawn Cornwallis 240 miles from his nearest base of supply at Camden. After rest, resupply, and the arrival of additional troops, Green recrossed the Dan about 10 days later. And you can see the, <clears throat> some reenactors here crossing the Dan River. For three weeks, the Americans, still pursued by Cornwallis, maneuvered, avoiding the general battle that Cornwallis sought until Green was in a position to choose the time and place of battle. The place he chose was Guilford Courthouse, which he had passed through during the race to the Dan River and had noted the favorable terrain. 
When Green arrived at Guilford Courthouse in March 1781, Cornwallis was just 12 miles away. Learning of Green's presence, he immediately began marching toward him, anticipating the fight he had been desperately seeking. Unlike many other battles, the Americans outnumbered the British two to one. Green called upon the same tactics of multiple lines of troops Morgan had successfully used at Cowpens, stationing his best troops at the rear. Also similar to Cowpens, Cornwallis had his troops enter the battle directly from a forced march without food or rest. And if you look on the top left photo here, that's at the Guilford Courthouse battlefield. And this is the road the British actually marched up to engage the Americans. Fighting uphill in a wooded area of rolling hills, Cornwallis slugged through the first two lines with his subordinates having to steady and rally their troops each time. And you can see on the lower left here, you get an idea of some of the terrain, it's rolling hills. And on the top right is a painting of some of that fighting. In desperation, Cornwallis fired his artillery into the line, knowing some of his own troops would be killed. General Green, seeing the severe hand-to-hand -hand fighting in his last line, began an orderly retreat. Cornwallis could claim a tactical victory since he held the field after the battle, but it had come at the cost of 25% of his force. With such losses, he could not continue offensive operations and withdrew to be resupplied. Cornwallis reportedly said, I have never seen such fighting since God made me. The Americans fought like demons. Though he withdrew, Nathaniel Green could claim a strategic victory since he had badly mauled the British while preserving the American army. He described this battle as long, obstinate, and bloody. The Patriots now controlled nearly all of North Carolina. Cornwallis now set his sights on Virginia, where he believed the war could be won. So if you ever get to visit Guilford Courthouse, it's a well-preserved battlefield in a park-like setting. And near the center of it is a statue of Nathaniel Green. And nearby is a placard, which has a really descriptive uh, wording on it, which says, Green is as dangerous as Washington. I never feel secure when encamped in his neighborhood. And that was from General Cornwallis. After Guilford Courthouse, Cornwallis retreated to Wilmington, North Carolina for supplies. And at the request of his superior, General Clinton, Cornwallis moved to the deep water port of Yorktown, Virginia to establish a base of operations and where he could be resupplied. And you can see Yorktown outlined here in the yellow. Cornwallis did not favor this location since he was exposed to naval attack and he could not maneuver his army. The strength of his position depended entirely on British control of the sea. During this time, the French army under Comte de Rochambeau moves from Newport, Rhode Island to join Washington's army in White Plains, New York for an attack against the British in New York City. And this attack against New York was Washington's preferred plan. So you can see up here, Newport, Rhode Island and the blue line is Rochambeau's French forces moving to White Plains, New York, right about here to join Washington. However, Rochambeau favored attacking the British in Virginia where they were less established and he secretly let French Admiral de Grasse, who commanded the French fleet in the Caribbean, know his preference. De Grasse coordinated with the Spanish to cover his duties in the Caribbean while he sailed north to the Chesapeake Bay. And you see this blue line down here is de Grasse's fleet sailing north toward Yorktown. He made his fleet available on the condition that it would be available for only two weeks in the fall. General Washington now had the difficult decision of planning to attack New York or completely changing strategy and moving south to attack Cornwallis at Yorktown. 
one of the most important decisions of the war. When Washington learned of Grasse's fleet sailing for the Chesapeake Bay, he began moving the American and French army south while misleading Clinton that he was about to attack New York City. The British, upon learning of the French fleet sailing for the Chesapeake Bay, also sailed there only to find the French already there six days ahead of them. The French sailed out to meet the British fleet, beginning the Battle of the Capes, a battle that is hardly known, but is possibly the most important naval battle in American history. And you can see here on the left, the blue line is the French fleet sailing out to meet the British. The French naval victory eliminated the possibility of evacuation or reinforcement by sea of the British army at Yorktown. With, and so this battle was so important that without a French victory in it, there would be no victory at Yorktown. And without an American victory at Yorktown, there likely would be no end of the war and no America as we know it. Now, with the British fleet driven off, the British army under Cornwallis was cut off by sea. The Allied army forces arrived in September and began a siege. The Allies had about 17,000 troops against the British and Hessian 8,000. Previously, Cornwallis had written a plea for help to General Clinton in New York stating, if you cannot relieve me very soon, you must prepare to hear the worst. The French and Americans slowly encircled and moved closer to Yorktown. And if you look at this map on the top left, uh, Yorktown is here with the British. The purple uniforms are the French and the blue uniforms are the Americans. So you can see they have the British uh, surrounded. A siege began during which the Allies and the British bombarded each other. Washington broke ground for the siege and fired one of the first shots of the bombardment. And you see in this painting on the top right, General Washington right here, lighting to the fuse to that cannon. Overnight, digging zigzag trenches, the French and Americans would move men and supplies forward in order to dig a trench parallel to the British outer one. And on the lower left here, you see some of those zigzag trenches at the Yorktown battlefield. A second parallel trench was dug, bringing the allies to within 350 yards of the British. Now they were close enough that all of their guns, not just the long range ones, could begin battering the British from three sides. On October 16th, Cornwallis attempted to have the army escape across the York River to Point Gloucester, but was stopped by a severe storm that wrecked his boats and which caused the loss of some of his men. This storm was one of the many providential weather-related events that aided the Americans during the course of the war. And you can see here this narrow part of the James River is where Cornwallis tried to have his troops escape. Now it's important to remember that the clock was ticking on the French fleets return to the Caribbean and the allies could not waste too much time sieging and attacking Yorktown. On October 14th, the Allies seized Redoubts 9 and 10, the last formidable defensive line of the British and positions blocking the advancement of the Allies. And you can see on this map on the top left, the, Brit or the um, French seized Redoubt 9 and the Americans seized Redoubt 10. And on the right top there, there's a photo of Redoubt 10 as it is today and the lower left, a painting of the attack by the French against Redoubt 9. The American assault on Redoubt 10 was led by a young Alexander Hamilton, you see in the lower middle. The Americans were now within lethal range of Yorktown and pounded it mercilessly. The British attempted to stop the siege by spiking the Allied cannons. A force snuck out at night and arrived at some of the cannons, but realized they had forgotten some of the vital equipment. While devising an alternate plan, 
They encountered American troops and began a brief fight with them in one of the trenches. This fight, which the Americans won, is considered the last one of the war. Therefore, the exact location of the end of the fighting of the Revolutionary War can be pinpointed to right here where these people are standing. So you can actually go there and stand in that spot. An indication of the French contribution to this battle is that nearly two thirds of allied casualties were French. Now on October 17th, Cornwallis asked for negotiations and favorable terms. Washington demands unconditional surrender and gives the British the same treatment they gave the Americans at Charleston. Colors are surrendered, weapons are stacked, and the British become prisoners. In 18th century military etiquette, this was the ultimate humiliation. Interestingly, on the same day, a British convoy carrying 6,000 troops left New York to reinforce Cornwallis, eventually turning back. At the formal surrender on October 19th, Cornwallis claims to be ill and sends his second in command, Brigadier General Charles O'Hara in his place. And you see O'Hara here at the bottom. And if you recall, he was the one who said that the British army was resolved to follow Green's army to the end of the world after the Battle of Calpens. O'Hara, presents his sword for surrender to Rochambeau, who directs him to Washington, who directs him to General Benjamin Lincoln, who had been forced to surrender in the same manner a year earlier at Charleston. And you can see that at this painting on the lower right, Washington's motioning to uh, O'Hara to give his sword to Benjamin Lincoln. Lincoln holds the sword for a few seconds, then hands it back to O'Hara. Upon hearing of the British surrender at Yorktown, the British Prime Minister Lord North exclaimed, oh God, it is all over. After the battle, not knowing if there would be more fighting in the area, Washington ordered the trenches to be filled so they could not be reused by the British. The current trenches at the battlefield have been dug over the years based on historical information. The British prisoners were marched to camps in Virginia and Maryland, while the officers returned to New York, then England. The ship on which Cornwallis returned to England also carried an interesting passenger, turncoat Benedict Arnold and his family. What happened to some of the key players in the Southern campaign? Well, Nathaniel Green, who, who you see on the left, he never won a battle, but won the campaign by clearing South Carolina of the British. A British officer wrote of Green, the more he is beaten, the farther he advances in the end. This reflected Green's perception of the fighting in the Carolinas when he wrote, we fight, get beat, rise and fight again. In battle, he was brave and decisive, excelling at planning, logistics, and using geography. He possessed a strong strategic vision. After the war, debts dogged him, partly the result of paying for his soldiers' clothing. Georgia awarded him and his wife, Katie, an estate, Mulberry Grove. He died in, at age 44 after getting sunstroke. Greensboro, North Carolina is named for him. Lord Charles Cornwallis in the middle. He returned to England a hero. He was found to be not at fault for the loss in America. He remained popular, aided by political connections and the favor of King George III. He became governor general of India, performing admirably. Returning to England, he became Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Upon returning to India for a second tour as governor general, he became ill and died there. And now on the right, Bannister Tarleton. He was disliked by enemies and friends. In the 18th century, it was customary that the victors invited officers of a defeated army to a series of dinner parties. 
Tarleton was the only one not to receive an invitation after Yorktown. He feared for his life while still in America and sought French protection. Returning to England, he was a celebrity, but that faded. He referred to those with whom he served as bad materials. He fell into drinking and gambling. He held several minor military assignments and served in the House of Commons for 22 years. His death at age 79 was barely mentioned by the papers. Now, Francis Marion, who you see on the top left, the Swamp Fox. After the war, he served in the State Senate and the South Carolina Constitutional Convention. He vigorously opposed confiscation of Tory property. Suffering financially during the war, after it, he became commander of Fort Johnson in Charleston Harbor, which provided him a secure salary. He married for the first time at 54, died at 63, and is buried in the swampy area where he harassed the British. Marion Square in the center of Charleston, South Carolina is named for him. Now the lower middle here, Horatio Gates, after the defeat at Camden, he never held another field command. After returning home, he pressed for a court of inquiry to clear his name. Congress eventually repealed his request and allowed Gates to serve at Washington's discretion, who assigned him to the Army headquarters at Newburgh, New York. He served one term in the New York State Legislature. He alienated many friends and supporters in his later years. He died in 1806 and is buried at Trinity Church near Wall Street in New York City, though the exact location of his grave is not known. Now, Daniel Morgan on the top middle, an exceptional field commander. Calpins was Morgan's last battle. He had suffered various ailments for years. The home he built in 1782 still stands near Winchester, Virginia. He engaged in business activities and land purchases, eventually owning 250,000 acres. He led part of the Virginia militia during the 1794 Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania. He served one term in the U.S. House of Representatives. His friend, Lieutenant Lighthorse Harry Lee, wrote when Morgan died at 67, no man better loved this world and no man more reluctantly quitted it. Now on the bottom right, Thomas Sumter, the Carolina Gamecock. He was one of the more unlikable characters of the revolution. He regularly failed to cooperate with other militia and army leaders, including his superiors. His forces experienced many defeats due to poor tactics, but he did win some battles. His inability to raise new militia troops plagued him. After the war, he faced lawsuits for plundering, all of which failed. He served in the House and the Senate. He died in 1832 at age 98, the oldest surviving general of the war. Despite his spotty record, during the dark times in South Carolina, when it appeared Britain would win the war, he took the field and inspired men to fight. The revolution was with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1783. The treaty officially recognized the United States as a sovereign nation independent of Britain. On December 4th, 1783, Washington said farewell to his officers. And you can see that in this painting on the left. On this same day, the last British ship left America. On December 23rd, before Congress in Annapolis, Washington takes the extraordinary step of resigning his position as commander of the American army, willingly giving up vast military power. And you see that on the painting on the right. After the war, more than 100,000 loyalists left America for Nova Scotia, the West Indies, or England. 
During the Southern Campaign, more battles were fought in North and South Carolina than in any other region of the colonies. In South Carolina, there were more than 200 battles and skirmishes. The American forces were a mixture of regular army troops and militia units, often led by dynamic men employing traditional tactics and guerrilla style warfare. The fighting took place against the backdrop of a bloody civil war pitting loyalist against patriot, neighbor against neighbor, and quite often family members against each other. The region was ravaged economically and socially unlike any other area in the colonies. Within this mixing bowl of drama, it was in the South where a resourceful group of Americans overcame what was initially a winning British strategy, winning the war and securing the independence proclaimed in 1776. Okay, so. Um, Blaine, for some reason we've lost your sound. No, I hear him. Blaine, can you speak again? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay. Did you hear the end of it? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> as long as everyone else did, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Are you ready for a couple of questions, Blaine? Sure, I'm ready. Okay. Um, gonna go back to close to the beginning. Uh, one of our guests, and myself included, uh, was not familiar with the snow battles in 1779. Can you elaborate just a little bit more about the snow battles? Yeah, they were, uh, well, it was kind of a series of battles in the wintertime. Um, two of them were Battle of 96 and the Great Cane Break. So it was just a series of battles and skirmishes where, um, you know, the Patriot and uh, Loyalist forces were, the militia forces were fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And often they were kind of local battles, especially for the American militia. It was kind of local forces that were involved. So there's a whole series of them, very um, sometimes small, very brief, but it was a, um, so they kind of, because they all took place in toward the end of the year and in December, they kind of tend to wrap it up as the Battle of the Snows campaign. Okay, interesting. Very good. Yeah, and some of those and some of those places are still there. They're, you know, depends upon the actual spot of the battle, but some of them are kind of modest things. You know, modest places you can visit, but a lot of them are still there. Okay. Does your research and um, level of expertise uh, go as far as the Native American tribes that may have uh, been involved in these Southern battles? Uh, not really. So, I mean, they were, and that's kind of something that, oh boy, um, you know, came up during my research, but, you know, when you, kind of research any of these topics, you can go in so many different directions. And it's almost as, so that's one of those topics. That, that's a good example of a topic where you run across it, you know, it's a significant part, an interesting part, but you have to set it aside and, and it could be its own presentation actually. So, okay. so I often tell people that when I put these presentations together that I feel as if I need to cut out as much as I leave in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I completely understand. Um, why do you think we focus mainly on the, the Northeast region when we're learning about discussing the Revolutionary War? Why is the Northeast more prominent in our memory and our history books? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, I, I, and this is a, um, kind of a personal opinion, but I think much of it is because a lot of the, like early in the war, there, there were the significant events like Bunker Hill and um, Lexington and Concord and 
uh, Valley Forge. And, and those are things that are uh, kind of seminal events. They're taught in school. And a lot of people know those places. And I think part of it is also because the um, northern part was more developed, uh, probably more industrially developed. And so I think it was, it had more um, you know, visibility, I guess might be okay. the word. Uh, but then also in the, the South, that was, you know, less developed and some of these, a lot of the, like where these battles took place at the time, like Calpins and uh, Guilford Courthouse were just very uh, rural areas. And they were just like Guilford Courthouse was just really a, a crossroads with a courthouse there. So I think um, also as the war went on, you know, other, it became more complex. And so I think some of the Southern campaign just kind of got, you know, it just got kind of folded into everything else. And it was easy to not be that familiar with it. Okay. Uh, you've, you've mentioned the French um, and their involvement. I have one guest that is asking about the contributions of the Spanish, the Dutch, um, some of the other um, global um, individual or global nations that were involved in the revolution? Yeah, so it's um, really, it's like several authors say at the end of the, when the Revolutionary War ended, it had really become a global war because obviously France was involved fighting with us. Right. But then the Spanish, they were actually involved kind of in the, um, uh, like Louisiana area and Florida a bit. Right. And then the Dutch, they were, they had their own, you know, beef with the British. And so they all, even though they, um, like the Dutch may not have fought directly here in America, but they were, saw it as an opportunity to fight the British. And so it really kind of did become a global war. So there were many um, nations who, either participated or contributed kind of at a secondary level. Yeah, so, so again, that's another one of those topics that could be its own presentation. <laughs> <laughs> sure, okay. And I have another question saying, didn't the South have more loyalists than the North? Uh, yeah, although, although it, it isn't as, um, yes, yes, they did, though it's not, um, you know, it's kind of easy to think of the South as being mostly loyalist, but it was really not, it was kind of close to 50-50. And like I said, during the presentation, a lot of that kind of shifted depending upon people's side would shift depending upon how the fighting was going. So, um, so there were, um, but there were a fair number of loyalists in the North as well, because they, uh, a lot of them were considered themselves British citizens and they were kind of iffy whether this revolution would succeed or even if it were a good thing. Okay. And that is all the questions that I have for you. Um, we, you do have a lot of compliments and a lot of thank yous in the chat and Q and A answer. And I've got to tell you personally, I was very intrigued with the, um, all of the information you shared with us. And so, hold on, Subo, give me one second. Looks like I may have one additional question. I'll give you one more, Blaine, if I can. Okay. Speaking of the North, few people know about the Castine debacle in Maine. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Yeah, well, that, that's actually mentioned in another presentation I have on topics of the American Revolution that it's kind of like either you didn't learn it in school or the rest of the story. But yeah, so there was a, um, an attempt to, an American attempt to capture Castine from the British. And it was, yeah, it went badly, poorly organized. But the, because of the theme of that other presentation I have, kind of the backstory to it is that, um, oh geez, his name just escaped me. The man, <laughs> the man who wrote the ride of Paul Revere, Emerson, um, Ralph Waldo, no, no, no. Emerson. 
no, he, he's not the one. <laughs> Whoever wrote that. Okay. I, I'm right. drawing I'm a not... blank. Sorry, okay. but his <laughs> his um the author's grandfather actually tried to court martial Paul Revere at the Battle of Castine Bay. So here, Revere, who we all know is a hero for spreading the news about Concord that, that the British were coming. Um, so his, um, so the guy who tried to court martial, the guy who conducted the court martial, his grandson tried to court martial or uh, wrote a book about, you know, lionizing Paul Revere. So it's kind of, oh. you know, it's ironic. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Very good. That's all I have in questions for today. So Suba, I will um, throw it back to you. All right. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, Blaine, thank you as well. But uh, on behalf of ARP Virginia, uh, thank you, Blaine, uh, for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with us this afternoon. If you enjoyed Blaine's talk, you'll want to mark your calendar for two weeks from today, which is March 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as he'll be back to talk about forgotten battles that influenced the fighting in the Pacific theater during World War II. Uh, one of the things I learned today was I didn't know there were so many battles held in South and North Carolina, uh, like more, like close to 300 or more. That is, I didn't know that because, yeah, what we've learned in history class, Blaine, it was more North centric, like Trudy said. So um, with the Northeast corridor. So, um, so always good to learn something new. Uh, also, folks, we'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. So we invite you to continue to explore, grow, and learn with us. Our Tuesday Explorer programs will continue this month and next. Please visit our website for details on our upcoming programs. The, the website is www.aarp.org forward slash virtual VA, which is V-I-R-T-U-A-L-V-A. I guess my tongue moving. All right. So until next time, we encourage you to stay curious and keep exploring. So thank you again, folks, for joining us from all around the country today. Thank you. Thank you.